Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing day. We just passed our 2.5 year mark and we are starting an amazing podcast. We have uh, so many great things that are going on and we pray that you continue to watch over us and let the angels camp around us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 And with that, we get into Chop It Up show episode seven, mm-hmm. HCP edition two. Yep. Uh, so last time, as you guys saw, we had the team minus me. They were going over kind of the origin story and what yeah, have you. John, where were you? Uh, I was closing a real estate deal, man. <laughs> I was closing a real estate deal. It was congrats. a lot of fun. Uh, thank you. That's three now? Uh, that's three now. Okay, congrats. Bro. Thank you, thank you. Um, so with that, um, let's flow into the discussion. Um, so firstly, it was our two and a half year mark yesterday. Um, so I just have a question for you guys as a cat that came in, you know, afterwards, but when you guys started, did you think that, you know, you were going to set out to like raise a fund and do all this crazy shit? De- definitely not. Uh, <laughs> and we initially started just really to invest our own capital into a few deals. And then eventually, you know, now we've invested substantially more capital than we expected because mm-hmm. we realized we like doing this and it's fun and something that we think really builds long-term wealth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing that we've been working on that I want to chop it up on in this format is we're looking to like, we each have our own lens with which we invest, Mm -hmm. right? We're each passionate about certain things. And so I think it'd be really useful for people listening, um, to get a sense of which partner likes, which kinds of fields, deals, like what interests us. And so that way they start to gain a sense of, okay, if I'm working on this kind of thing, I should probably reach out to Brandon or Henri or Jared. Mm -hmm. Um, So Brandon, kick it off for us. Like what types of companies or fields like inherently interest you more than others? Yeah, this is a a great question. And just even backing up, like a lot of investors tend to just invest in things that they like or people that are similar to them, Right. which is why we started Harlem Capital in the first place, because most fund managers happen to be white males. Yeah. And so Harlem Capital started because we wanted to be um, show representation. We wanted to focus on people who look like us. Uh, in terms of deals that I am super excited to invest in, consumer deals um, are very interesting to me just because I'm in the c- consumer aspect. Media deals are huge. Uh, I remember the first time I met Morgan and hearing about Blavity and having an opportunity to work with them early on and eventually invest in them was huge and monumental for us. And I'm trying to think of any other big time industries that I like. Um, looking into voice. I know we've been looking into voice. I know you like right. voice. Uh, and I think those are some of the industries that I like or just some of the companies that I'm looking at. Okay. What about you, JT? Yeah. Um, so I guess in terms of like founders, black women all day. Um, yeah. Hey. Very resilient. They always get stuff done. Usually like two times qualifies and need to be to be running the business that size. Getting married to one too. Text. But, We're going to get that text after this. <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> but in terms of industries that I like, I think the legal tech space is very interesting. Yeah. Um, so we worked in banking and private equity and just the process that it takes to like get a legal document drafted mm-hmm. and finalized is just burdensome. It's, it's cumbersome. It's too long. Yeah. And if you're trying to compare different documents, it just takes forever and you're getting charged a lot. So mm. the industry is ripe for disruption. I think it could be done a lot cheaper and quicker. So that's exciting to me. I like the consumer space as well. Um, I think just the, the caveat is just being conscious of businesses that could be fads. And so as long as it's mm-hmm. something that's going to be long-term sustainable and is really differentiated, I think it's something I'm interested in. Yeah, word. Yeah, and just to give some perspective, so um, we're industry agnostic, obviously, and you know we have some industries we don't like and more that we do like. But in general, for me personally, I like to look at deals from the business perspective. So does this business have value? Who are the customers? Uh, what is the monetization? So one of our investments... Uh, they're doing you know a dollar per month per device for two years. The contract's up front. It's a great kind of like business model. Or, or another one of our investments, the customers are you know Fortune 500 companies. And so those are the type of investments I like. But then just to give a higher level in terms of the VC landscape, so 60% of um, exits are 
uh, enterprise, mm-hmm. but 60% of exit values are consumer. And so like, even as a VC, like we may like consumer enterprise more, but you have to also know that yes, consumer may be bigger risks and maybe more fads, but a lot of the big exits, the Snapchats, the Facebooks of the world, the Stitch Fitches are gonna be in the consumer space. So as we say that, like one thing that comes to mind is the radical difference almost between the West and the East Coast style of investing. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely worth mentioning um, when I discovered venture, it was first through the lens of the West Coast, which um, for those listening, West Coast style investing, I feel like it's like spray and pray. They put money into as many deals as possible that they think has the potential to be a billion dollar company. And as a result, they get a lot more zeros, it seems. But as a result, also, they get the Snapchats, they get the Facebooks and they get the companies that ultimately end up making the most impact on the marketplace as a whole. They get these behemoth companies. Um, and while that is, you know, attractive, I wish, you know, my bets turned into 100 X's. Um, <laughs> True. It wasn't until I discovered the East Coast temperament that it started to feel more like investing. It started to feel more like the intelligent investor, so to speak. So one thing, um, so yeah, I want to take this time to first shed light on the East Coast style and then shed light on how we view deals so that anyone who's listening, um, they know if we're a fit for them or not and they know how to approach us or not. What do you guys think? Yeah, so I think part of that is due to just New York being the second biggest city for investing and a lot of finance people are here in New York and so you have a lot more traditional bankers and private equity and hedge fund people. So I think that just perspective is slightly different than the Valley kind of grew through venture. And I think secondly, in terms of us, like, I think, you know, part of the reason uh, why besides, you know, you having uh, maybe white males or Asian male investors is also if you're looking only for billion dollar companies, you're looking for billion dollar industries. And so the Mm -hmm. reality is for a lot of founders, they create um, companies that solve their own problems. And for a lot of founders of color, they're not creating the Facebooks of the world because maybe that's not what actually is gonna make their communities better, right? So a lot of the bigger mm-hmm. companies, whether it be Blavity, whether it be Bevel, um, whether it be Maven or Uncharted Play, which is electricity in Africa, like these things are not as uh, not as Silicon Valley approachable. And though they may be great businesses, a hundred million, half a billion, and maybe they do reach a billion, but they're not kind of that quick, like we're gonna scale extremely quick to billion dollar companies. And so I think our approach, we don't have necessarily we can't build our model on, hey, every investment we do needs to be a billion dollar company. Because then we're not targeting our communities as much. But I think mm-hmm. if we know that, then we say, okay, we need to invest in businesses that are less likely to go to zero. And so that's why mm-hmm. for us, we don't invest in pre-revenue businesses. We need to kind of reduce the risk of, of a business going to zero. And so hopefully, as a business has been around for two years, has revenue, we're more likely to see that business at least you know, return capital. And so as you can prevent the zeros, you're able to actually invest in businesses that aren't billion dollar companies. I think that's a different investment model that we're taking as an approach, given our founders are in different maybe sectors in some of the Valley sectors. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's good. I recovered a lot there. Um, so I want to push back a little bit. I think most VCs would love to have a billion dollar exit, yeah. but, um, <laughs> especially because the, because so many startups fail. I think the stat is over 75% of venture funded startups fail. Um, you have to have your winners be able to return your whole funds so right. basically make up for all your profits. You need, you know, one out of 10 deals to kind of do that. And so I think, again, most VC firms are looking at that. But what makes, you know, the West Coast unique is that, as I already said, they kind of grew through VC. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of those huge behemoth companies are based out there. Mm-hmm. They have employees that leave, want to start their own companies. The VC firms that got rich during the tech bubble, they're also still based out there. And it's kind of like an echo chamber where everybody is kind of like, you know, talking about, you know, the next software, AI, um, <laughs> the infrastructure is there. So it's much easier to find advisors. They're just talking to each other a lot about more about these. Yeah. And so I think it's easier to kind of like be, be trying to spray and pray and just trying to like, you know, take home run swings to try to get the next billion dollar exit yeah. out there. Yeah, and to the take community. a step back, I will flip on you guys. Um, like just explain the venture model. I'm like, why you know like who should come to us as venture investors and why we look for certain investments i think that's a big portion oftentimes we're telling people hey like this is not a venture deal it doesn't mean you don't have a good business this is just not meant for our model i think a lot of people don't understand like what what kind of deals we're looking for besides the industry that we covered yeah brandon take that and then i want to add to to that because i uh, I have a, maybe a different perspective than us on than yeah you guys uh i mean in like the point of venture per se is like one one point is to exit 
the, the point of us investing is because we want to exit. You can only exit usually two ways, IPO or acquisition. And so sometimes when you start a business, that's literally not the end goal. You start a business for cash flow reasons. You start a business to impact, blah, blah, blah. Right. But when you come into the venture space, you're growing at a breakneck speed mm-hmm. and you're giving up quite a bit of equity in return for that. And you have to return that money back to your investor, you know, many fold sometimes. And so that can, that's not for every company. So I don't think that um, all like comparable to like small businesses, small businesses are just like grow 10, 15% year over year. But for venture capital businesses, those things can grow like 50, 60%, maybe even like two, three X a year. So knowing how fast your company is growing, knowing how fast you're going to add new verticals and revenue streams is something that you have to focus on when you're looking at small business or venture capital business. Yeah, I think that's right. And I I think that nowadays as I see it, uh, a venture business is started by design to scale up and tackle a really large market opportunity Mm -hmm. shift, whether it's a billion dollar opportunity or a several hundred million dollar opportunity. But one thing that I want to riff on right now, because it's just something that I go back and forth with with myself, is there are often businesses that maybe uh, historically wouldn't be considered venture, but mm. have pulled it off and have executed in a venture way. Like Casper, a mattress company. Like a mattress company. Or like like SoulCycle. Company. Like WeWork. <laughs> right? So how do we explain this? Right? Because sometimes I deal with a very real problem of me looking at a founder and saying, oh, yeah, this is not venture. And they'll say, well, what about X? And then, you know, and they'll, Does they'll it just come up to scalability? So let's dive into it. Like, what, <laughs> cause for me, I think it ends up being about the founder and how intentional they are about how they hmm. want to grow the business. But I'm open wow. to different perspectives. It's literally like Blavity. I think Morgan just posted. She's like, hey, did you guys know we were more than a blog and that we were the folks behind Afrotech and 2190 and XYZ? A lot of people have started blogs before but haven't raised millions of dollars in yeah. venture right. and been able to scale as quickly as them. So that that's like a, an amazing point that you're bringing up. Hmm. I think it comes down to three things for me, and there may be some additional ones. I think one is just how big the market opportunity is. And so even if the company may not hmm. be an inherently you know, an 80% margin business, if there's a huge market opportunity like a WeWork, um, you know, leasing office space, that's a huge market opportunity. So that's one. I think two is just the vision and the storytelling ability of the founder. So mm. if somebody is able to position things mm. appropriately, that's a big one. True. Sell on how big the market yeah. opportunity is and why they're the biggest or the best person to do it. Yep. I think that's key. And the third is just like basically having a company that investors are willing to throw money at. Um, mm. And so like Making we were venture capital. If, if they weren't <laughs> able to actually get money for investors, it never would have worked. If you think about it, they have to buy real estate holdings which are yeah. very expensive right <laughs> and they keep doing that over and over again but investors for some reason decided to deploy capital amazon for example they were making profits for for decades yeah right but because people were willing to fund it it made sense as a vc investment and they yep. could mm. wait until they were actually able to turn profits mm. Mm. I think your third point is a sub point of the second point. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> you're only willing to throw something money at something that someone paints as like, you know, this mm. awesome thing. Um, so that was <laughs> storytelling well is key. Storytelling. That is venture, is right? Key. And that's John's. Uh, that's John's that's the forte. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> guys, you guys. And, and what story are we telling? Wow. Right? Like. Let's extrapolate for a moment. Like, by the way, for everyone like <laughs> watching, like we're talking all this about like, um, you know, what it takes to, for us to invest in you. But in reality, like we're out here, you know, raising a fund. Yeah, um, startup. Yeah. We're you know we're an upstart fund. We have investors as well. We have investors as well, <laughs> and we got a story tell, and we have to convince fund of funds or individuals or whomever that we're the best bet for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. Maybe this is something worth riffing on here. Wow. Like, you know, it's like, you know, taste of your own medicine kind of yeah. kind of deal, mm-hmm. right? Like, so can we just spend a few moments and then we'll wrap it up because we have just another five minutes. Can we spend a few moments legitimately mm-hmm. just just sharing out loud why we think that we're like the best, like just the, the team that's most well equipped for this opportunity? Yeah. Wow. Yes, I mean, going mm-hmm. through... 
we we finished our deck, which is like like a year and a half. V ninety one. Yeah, we're on version ninety one of the deck so now. Have a, that was a like whole, four months of hard work before we were like free floating. Yeah, yeah, but a whole a whole nother level of appreciation now when we receive decks. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think you you underestimate how much time goes into it, mm-hmm. and when people are critiquing. I think now there's a difference before when we were investors versus now where we we have a fund as investors. I think. Now, like mm-hmm. you actually have to build the business, you have to build your processes, build the deck, go shake the can and ask for money. So now, <laughs> <laughs> New York's different, finest, <laughs> a whole different level of empathy now uh, yeah. for what founders go through versus <laughs> before. If you go work at a fund, the infrastructure's there, and you're just trying to choose good deals. It's a very mm-hmm. different perspective versus like, hey, I now understand what it's like to be a founder. Even though I'm an investor, I'm still a founder. Mm-hmm. I think that process for me has been very humbling. Uh, it has brought that level of empathy that a lot of VC investors say, hey, it makes sense if you're a founder or if you're a VC investor because it gives you an empathy level. Now we have that same level of empathy as well. Right. But but so, okay, great. Anyone who's raising a fund can say that, right? But we're going after a very specific opportunity and there mm-hmm. have been people that have tried and died before <laughs> us doing this same thing. Tried and died. They've tried and died. They've rung the bells. It makes our job harder. Because people are like, wait, aren't you just like, and then, you know, fill in the blank, Mm -hmm. you know, so why are going to, and, and by the way, the reason I think this is going to be cool is because when we raise a damn fund, Mm -hmm. like we're going to look back to this exact moment and it's going to be a cool thing to like bookmark too. But why are we going to be the team that's going to get this done? Really? So basically I think about it three ways. Like we think about founders, right? And we look at like, what's the problem? What's your solution? And like, why are you the right person? And why is this the right time? Uh, problem was folks of color and women were just very like undervalued and overlooked. Our solution is to start raising money and to get aggressively into seed and series A and be able to help these companies go from A to C, potentially exit and to prove the the fact. Why are we the best people to be there? I mean, we've been a team that's been together for quite a long period of time. We've interned together uh, during college. We've lived together. We went to school together. We've worked together. And we started investing in together and things are just coming together, whether it's media, brand building, whether it's folks reaching out to us through LinkedIn, Twitter, what have you, whether it's mentors putting their hard earned money, blood, sweat, and tears and relationships into us and us just like really putting our like hands to the plow and building step by step by step. We're coming. We're just like manifesting it to be to be just frank with it. And so I think that's why we are the best people because we've come the farthest pretty early in our careers and we're proving things out day in and day out. And I think our track record is starting to prove that, whether it's with the work ethic, whether it was with the meetings that we're getting or the deals we're getting access to. And so to answer the question, we're not necessarily there yet, but we've been building so much momentum and so Mm -hmm. much, we've been executing on such a strong strategy that we are just at the cusp, we're about to like explode and just like make it happen. I think you covered a lot, but can mm-hmm. y'all speak to why it's the right time? Yeah, and why is it the right time? Um, frankly, in the last like five to 10 years, like folks of color and women have just been starting to get the right funding. They've been starting to create great companies for their respective industries. And then now those fund managers are being put in place with Female Founders Fund and other folks. And I think they're going to take huge advantage, and us included, of having the opportunity to invest in people who've been overlooked and get outsized returns. So, pumped about it. Yeah, yeah. well said. <laughs> I think you covered a lot, and I think part of what's, I mean, there's tons of reasons why it may, may be happening, but we had some good examples. I think having the Obama administration was helping us <laughs> have like, That's an interesting point. Reach the pinnacle of, you know, American There's leadership. no thing, no such thing as racism anymore. Yeah. Obama's been president. And it's, <laughs> like, and, it's, it, and it's also cheaper and easier than it's ever been to start a company because, you know, with the tech platforms, with all things you can outsource, with the co-working spaces, right? There's just less barriers to, to entry. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, to put that all in a concept, you're, you're saying that the world has been democratized to an extent yeah. for folks to just step up and, and execute. And it's really on you at this point to proved out the pudding you know that's an interesting point um i love i love like being re- being reminded of macro things that hmm. you know it's just sometimes we forget that like how much of a tangible impact it has on the marketplace but the obama administration was huge um yeah. uh, and then another thing that i think was big is 
millennials are now the largest segment of the population yep. mm. um, and we're we're becoming the largest segment of the working population um, and so I think that being a diversity focused fund in the last 10 years was probably unfeasible mm-hmm. you know it's probably it, what the maturation wasn't there is like MySpace like I feel like MySpace didn't get that critical hold because mobile mm-hmm. wasn't mature yet you know it, in order for Uber to be Uber mobile devices had to be in more hands and so it took that critical mass in order for them to build on top of that Mm -hmm. so i think you know when i sat down with mark samuelson he was like john i believe it's just four things for things to take off it's the idea right it's the market it's the timing and it's the execution yeah um and when i look at it i mean i just i just think that this you know the stars have a line in the macro whether it's the administration and whether it's like diversity now being a thing that people yeah. are looking yeah. at and yeah. facing real pressure that. to put yeah. dollars in and by the way this is not just like some subjective thing like look at every company now introducing a chief diversity officer right whether yeah. they're actually important or not or pivotal or instrumental time has yet to tell but people are spending the money uh, with attempts to fix this um, and so I think the timing is perfect for, you know, well executed seed stage diversity focused fun run by four young men of color soon to be <laughs> soon to add women. Um, and when you look at each of our individual paths, like we've been walking this walk and talking the talk for way before, you mm-hmm. know, Harlem Capital actually came together. True. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so I think it's the culmination, you know, the passion's there, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears, like you said, is there. <sighs> um, and now, you know, now it's time for the execution. <laughs> right. I, I still want to hear Henri's answer because, I mean, I think... And then it, you'll close this out. Yeah, and just to let folks know, like, this was an idea that stemmed from Henri one day. He reached out to all of us to jump on board. So I think it would be good to hear from the guy who created this in his mind. Um, yes, I mean, I think for me, I think the first thing is, is passion, which is what we look for in founders. I think this team is super passionate about this and, Mm -hmm. you know, we're doing this as part time right now. Right. So we started this when we were working, uh, you guys are still working and now we're doing this (laughs) while we're in school. And so you have to be very passionate when you're not getting paid, uh, when it's literally just outflows of dollars. Like, and then how do you believe in yourself? Do you believe in this mission so much that you're willing to give up, you know, short-term gain for long-term or short-term pain for long-term gain? Like that's something I think you have to have. I think this team really does believe in this mission a lot. I think too, to the point of diversity, I think it's everywhere, whether it be gender because of the Me Too movement, you know, whether people are doing this because they actually care or other sympathy, like, you know, that can be discussed, but it's people are focused on these topics, on gender equality and on race. And so I think this is the right time we're primed. And we have a lot of mentors who tried to do this and maybe didn't work out, not because of them, but because of the timing, right? And mm-hmm. now we have them to help guide us. Like, exactly. why did this not work? And I, we're very fortunate to have those people in our lives who've kind of gone through this and went on to do other things very successfully. Um, I think those are the two main reasons for me. Yeah. Awesome. So I want to touch on that because I haven't chimed in here, but like, again, can't emphasize enough the passions there. And mm-hmm. I think really what makes us special is like the sheer willpower and grit. Like, if you look at any one of our individual backgrounds, like, we have crushed it at any level, any obstacle that's came in front of us, we ran through walls. And I think even most importantly, though, aside from that, we have, like, a higher calling here. If I look back on, like, things I did in middle school, like, my application essays to college, like, why I wanted to go into finance in the first place, it's always been about improving things for my family, but also my community. I think the wealth gap, for example, is just out of control. Mm -hmm. And it's because of things that have gone on for decades and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Um, But because we're all focused on that and we found each other and we push each other, we're balanced, but we're all on that same like Mm -hmm. willpower wave. I think we're going to we're going to get it done. Yeah. And I think a good way to close out is there was this stat that said I think we shared it on our Slack channel and it said um, like the average net worth for the black individual in 2050 is going to be negative. And to that stat, I say you didn't ask us about it. Mm. Not if we have anything to do with it. So this has been Harlem Capital, episode seven, uh, version two of us chopping it up together. I hope you guys have enjoyed the dynamic that we have uh, as a team. You can see there's camaraderie, there's brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, And, you know, we're we're out here doing the damn thing. So please do uh, subscribe if you haven't. Drop comments below. uh, Ask us more questions. That way we have reasons to keep coming at you, uh, delivering that fresh heat question of the day Mm -hmm. who do you know when we when we say passionate determined founder who's putting their all into their craft 
who's the first person that comes to mind when we say that mm. so tag a founder that you know in the comments below that matches that description so we can get connected and potentially get a deal done see you guys peace peace, peace. peace.